البروفيسور احمد عصاف از بروفيسور فيري ويل نون از بروفيسور اوف اوفثالمولوجي ان ذا فاكولتي اوف ميديسين عين شمس يونيفرسيتي ان ايجيبت اند هي از فيلو اوف ذا رويال كوليدج اوف سيرجنز اوف ايدنبرغ اند كونسلتنت اوف ريفاكتيف اند فيكو سيرجري از ويل از شير هولدر ان الوطني اي هوسبيتال ان كايرو As many people know, Professor Rassaf is a premium cataract surgeon using a premium uh, IOL since many years and is very famous for implementing the most advanced technology uh, such as femtosecond laser in, in cataract and refractive surgeries since many years. And uh, he's uh, very famous as well in performing a lot of complicated cataract surgery uh, uh, cases with intrastleral haptic fixation. Uh, together with iris repair and different techniques uh, of pupilloplasty, uh, as well as uh, surface ablation profiles and intracornea rings, etc. Uh, of course, Dr. Asaf had uh, international uh, peer reviews of uh, 11 articles and presented more than 40 presentations in international meetings. And he's uh, currently a board member of the uh, ISRS, and uh, he got the award of achievement from the American Academy of Ophthalmology in 2017. Uh, well, uh, Professor Asaf, uh, during his presentation, he will uh, share his experience about what to do and what not to do uh, with presbyopic uh, correcting IOL. So I give this speech now to Professor Asaf uh, uh, to take the lead. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammed, for this uh, introduction. And I would like to thank uh, BBI and uh, Visual for putting me in this uh, webinar about the presbyopia correcting IOL. So let's start my presentation. I, first of all, I don't have any financial interest, unfortunately, in uh, any of the subjects mentioned <laughs> in, this, in this presentation. I would like as well to acknowledge uh, uh, Sybil Schultz from Germany and Angeline Yusek from Australia for helping me to, with some slides of this presentation. So uh, uh, as you know now, uh, I was surprised that we have about 1.7 billion people currently with presbyopia worldwide and this number is expected to increase to 2.7 billion within the next few decades almost doubled in the next few decades by the 2050 so uh, we are expecting a 17.2 percent growth of presbyopia correcting iols within the next five years because of the growing patients the expectations that put demands on presbyopia correcting iols so far, the presbyopia correcting IOLs are dominated by the multifocal technology. We had the uh, accommodative IOLs in a few decades or a few years later uh, before, and uh, these lenses did not prove the, to restore accommodation as expected, so they are just withdrawn from the market for the meaning time. Probably this is the technology of the future, of course, but so far, uh, we mean by presbyopia correcting IOL the multifocal IOLs and these IOLs proved some success but still have some challenging challenges because they are different optics compared to the monofocal lenses. Monofocal IOLs transmit the light rays and refract the light rays to be focused in a single focus on the retina inside the human eye. Uh, but uh, as you know that uh, there are some challenges with the multifocal lenses because the multifocal lenses are quite different from the monofocal IOLs. The monofocal IOLs uh, focus the light rays and refract the light rays inside the eye into a single focus on the retina. So the light rays coming from distance objects are focused on the retina. While with the multifocal lenses, these lenses works by a principle called simultaneous perception. The light rays split it inside the eye to do for psi, one dedicated for distance object and the other dedicated for near object. And the brain perceived all the time two images, one from the distance and one from the near object. Actually, what's known as the multifocal lenses actually are bifocal lenses, not multifocal lenses. So now the issue here with the simultaneous perception that when the patient is looking at distance object, the, the, we have one focused, one, one focused image on the retina and this image is superimposed by another blurred image coming from the near focus in the vitreous cavity and vice versa when this eye looks at near object, the, uh, the eye will receive 
focused image on the retina coming from the near object and this image will be superimposed by another blurred image by the light rays coming from the distance object and this results in reduced quality of vision and sometimes nighttime halos and glare and of course uh, there are some lost light energy because of the diaphractive optics we all know that the diaphractive optics cause some loss of the light energy uh, uh, this is an inherent uh, disadvantage of the diaphractive optics and we are counting on the brain to adapt for these changes and to get better quality of vision. So neural adaptation plays a very important role in the success with the multifocal IOLs. So because of this multifocal lens, or let's say the bifocal lens, this lens actually uh, known by reduced or limited functionality because it provides only two foci for distance and near, and known uh, by, the, by the reduced visual quality and the nighttime halos and glare. Now we have the trifocal lenses and these trifocal lenses, we add another focus for the dedicated for the intermediate distance to improve the functionality of these lenses after implantation inside the eye. And these lenses have improved as well improved optics to reduce the nighttime halos and glare and improve them and reduce the light energy lost inside the eye. And again, the technology has evolved to what's known as the EDOF lenses, which are extended depths of focus lenses act as a monofocal lens, but with the diaphractive or refractive optics can divert the light rays inside the eye into a series of foci across the retina to provide improved depths of focus. And this uh, type of lenses improve the visual quality for distance and provide some functional vision for the intermediate object, intermediate distance object, but sacrifice the near object. So we have now, pretty uh, large um, optic designs with the trifocal lenses and EDOF lenses now are available in the market uh, on top of the old uh, bifocal or the multifocal lenses. So the success nowadays with the multifocal lenses relies on mainly five categories. The first is to choose the right candidate, the second to choose the right eye, the third to choose the right IOL, the fourth is to choose to do the accurate biometry and there are some surgical issues. Starting with the uh, choosing the right candidate. So, right candidate, we have three main issues here. We have psychological factors, biological factors, and occupational factors. I call it myself psycho-bio-occupational factors. And these psycho-bio-occupational factors for regards to the psychological part of this, the patient should be highly motivated. And picking up those patients as a highly motivated patients for the multifocal or presbyopia correcting IOLs, I start the discussion with the patients by two questions. First, the question, do you mind wearing glasses after cataract surgery? This is the first question. And the patient if say, no, I don't mind, well and good. The discussion is over. Now we can proceed for the investigations for just routine cataract surgery and the patient is scheduled for cataract surgery. If the patient say, yes, I'm happy, I'm willing to get rid or, or I'm thinking to get rid of their glasses, my very next question is, which glass do you want to get rid of? Because the patient don't, the patients do not know that they have different uh, uh, glasses for different uh, distances, the reading and distances. So the patient, if the patient say, yes, I want to get rid of both glasses. So we start the discussion about the presbyopia correcting IOLs. And we, if it's available for the patient from the psychological point of view or not. I'm starting the discussion with this patient stressing on the some items. First of all, this patient, I, I'm just I used to tell the patients that this technology is not perfect technology. And this technology tries to mimic the accommodation lost by the crystalline lens, by the human crystalline lens. So the patient must understand that this is some sort of pseudo accommodation. This is some sort of technology that can, that tries to mimic the normal eye. And the patient must accept some compromises in the visual quality like nighttime halos and glare and, glare and reduce visual and reduce contrast sensitivity. And I used to tell the patient that occasionally the patient might need 
distant glasses while driving at night or some reading glasses for very fine print in some uh, and sometimes maybe about 10% of the time. I never guarantee 100% of spectacle independence with this patient. And if, if the patient agree with this, we are going for the multifocal lenses regarding the uh, psychological point of view. Uh, uh, so, to regards the biological factors here, my personal insight that ladies are usually very generally more interested in spectacle independence compared to me. This is my personal insight and most probably this, this group of candidates are more tolerable for suboptimal quality of vision in favor of freedom of glasses during some daily near activities as you can see in the photo in the left side of the screen. And of course my another personal insight on the contrary, low myopes are quite difficult to satisfy after implantation with the presbyopia correcting IRL. So, especially if this patient does not have a significant cataract. So this is my uh, chart or my selection criteria uh, for the implantation of presbyopia correcting IRLs in the presence of clear lens or significant cataract in relation to the refractive error. For the patient without cataract here, this is nuclear sclerosis, without cataract, I don't do presbyopia correcting IOLs with patients without refractive error or in the myopic side, in the low myopic side. Uh, with the moderate to high myopia, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to do presbyopia correcting IOL without cataract for the moderate myopia, but again with the high myopia, I'm a little bit reluctant to do multifocal lenses in this set of patients uh, because most probably these patients have uh, some, um, uh, some sort of subtle macular changes uh, associated with high myopia, even if it's not uh, uh, discovered during examination, probably this might evolve in the near future. For the other side with the hypropia, of course, the low hypropic patients are very good candidates to uh, for multifocal lenses. A moderate hypropia, okay, I'm approaching this patient cautiously, but with high hypropia, I prefer not to do multifocal lenses because of the difficulty in assessing the accurate biometry in this short axial length eye. And sometimes, most probably, these eyes have some sort of uh, high foveal hypoplasia. So we, this might negatively uh, affect the visual outcomes after peripheral correcting IVMs. With the presence of cataract, my spectrum is getting more or less broader. Uh, so I can approach patient, patients with the significant cataract, even if this uh, patient does not have uh, uh, a significant refractive error because once removed the media opacity, the patient appreciate the improved quality of vision. Again, with the high myopia and high hypropia, I prefer not to do multifocal lenses in the high myopia because of the macular issues, most probably potential macular issues uh, might be there. And with the high hypropia because of the difficulty in the, getting the uh, accurate biometry. Uh, uh, here, um, of course, regards the occupational factors, of course, as we all know that it's better not to implant these lenses in patients with the, uh, some, uh, some occupation like the professional drivers and pilots. Maybe we can, there is some rule of EDOF lenses, especially the refractive type, we are not sure yet, but most probably we can we can do some sort of uh, uh, visual rehabilitation and implantation of uh, new models of presbyopia correcting I will at least the of lens in this patient, but I'm not sure yet. This opened uh, um, a, a new era for uh, presbyopia correcting I will in some uh, occupations. So uh, to choose the right candidate, do the multifocal lenses for highly motivated candidates. And these lenses, I used to say, these lenses are smart lenses for smart people. Don't implant these lenses in illiterate people because they usually have very high expectations. And the, these patients think that the doctor is, um, is, is something like God. Uh, so the patient must be smart enough to understand the compromises with this type of technology and don't try to convince the patient about this technology if the patient is happy with his or her glasses never uh, try to open a discussion with the multifocal lenses and of course don't do multifocal lenses in presbyopia without refractive error and try to 
undersell, don't oversell and guarantee total spectacular independence of these patients because they can never, it's, can, can, can never be guaranteed to get 100% of spectacular independence. So uh, here, uh, what about now that choosing the right eye, we talked about the choosing the right patients, now choosing the right eye, we talk about the tear film, slit lamp examination, and the pupil size and angle kappa. Regards to the tear film, of course, it's very important. It's most important refractive media of the human eye. And because of the modern lifestyle with increased screen times on digital, digital devices, this exacerbates dry eye symptoms, especially in this group of patients. And dry eye is very common in this periopic group of patients, as you all know. And Dry eye will definitely influence the preoperative measurements before cataract surgery, and this dry eye will continue to worsen after the cataract surgery. So it's very important to treat this dry eye before uh, scheduling the patient for presperopia correcting IOL. Uh, you can see here the tear film with the dry eye, that dry eye is the most common cause of patient dis dissatisfaction after premium IOLs is blurred vision. And the second most common cause of blurred vision after a presbyopia correcting IOL is dry eye. So it's very important to pick those patients with dry eye and try to aggressively treat these patients before scheduling them for cataract surgery. Uh, of course, uh, corneal topography is very nice screening tool to assess the tear film quality. Look for the minor subtle distortion of the corneal miles on the corneal surface. This, this will tell you uh, some data about the quality of the tear film. Uh, I personally do the corneal topography and I have the tear film analyzer to give me that uh, gives me more detailed uh, comprehensive data about the tear film regards the quality of the tear film regard the composition of the tear film a breakup time a meibomian gland the lipid layer and even the blink the quality of the blink of this patient whether the patient can blink completely or close the palpebral pressure completely with each blink or not and i have an overall uh, report here regards the, uh, the tear film quality of this patient and you can see that the tear meniscus is very low in this patient in particular and should be addressed before scheduling the patient to cataract surgery. This is an example of a patient of mine that uh, patient comes for asking for presbyopia correcting IOL and was diagnosed as mild to moderate dry eye. I gave him tear lubricant uh, um, and and the uh, short course of, of topical steroids. And after two weeks, you can see before uh, the treatment of dry eye, the point spread function is distorted and diffuse and the, uh, the stress ratio is very low. And even the contrasensitivity of the patient is not is below normal. And you can see even here, the higher corneal, uh, the corneal abrasions and the ocular abrasions are little bit high, especially the uh, spherical abrasion and the coma here. And after treatment, you can see after treatment that improvement in the point spread function, improvement in the stress ratio, improvement in the contrastivity and reduction of the ocular abrasions, higher abrasions. So just treatment and improving the tear film quality has significant impact in the quality of vision before cataract surgery and definitely will have in its impact on the measurement of the corneal and the biometry and the corneal astigmatism as well as on the visual outcomes after the cataract surgery. So what to do to analyze for the tear film? You have to do some vital staining with lysamine green stain and fluorescein stain. Of course, you should do fluorescein breakup time. Do corneal topography instead of fluorescein uh, breakup time because it's a screening tool to uh, detect subtle changes on the anterior corneal surface and tear film inspect the Myers, you have to inspect the Myers very carefully. And if you have the fancy machines for the tear film analyzer and analysis, of course, go for the tear film analyzer. Don't include any eye with corneal dystrophy in, for um, presbyopia correcting IOL and try don't ever try to take preoperative measurements in patients with dry eye because this will significantly influence the measurement with the corneal topography as well as with the biometry and never operate the, uh, on eye before treatment uh, of dry eye, aggressively treatment of dry eye. And uh, of course we should do a comprehensive slit lamp examination to exclude eyes with other comorbidities that might negatively affect the visual quality after 
uh, presbyopia correcting IL, so, something like anterior replacement membrane dystrophy of the cornea or posterior corneal dystrophy. Of course, you should exclude uh, the eyes with the glaucoma and uh, uh, other form of um, diabetic or other macul maculopathy might present during clinical examination. Uh, now here, do whatever you can do, of course, detail, dilated fundus examination. And if you any doubt about the status of the macula, we can do uh, OCT or the macula or OCT of the optic nerve to measure the nerve fiber layer if uh, there's any doubt regards the glaucoma of the optic scuffing. I don't include patients with any form of diabetic maculopathy in, in for presbyopicorating IOL. Of course, glucometous eyes are not included and I don't include patients with drusen in the macula because this may evolve, may evolve in uh, age-related macular degeneration, which compromise the visual quality of the, uh, the patient after implantation in the near future. What about the uh, size of the pupil? It's very controversial because maybe patients with large mesopic pupil does not complain of reduced quality of vision or nighttime halos and other patients with smaller pupil might complain of the nighttime halos and glare. This might be related to some psychological factors and the design of the IOL. However, it's agreed that not to include patients with mesopic pupil uh, larger than five millimeter in diameter because this will increase the risk of perception of nighttime halos after and glare after implantation. What about the angle kappa? Again, this is a very con controversial issue here. The angle kappa is the angle between the uh, visual axis and the pupillary axis. And normally it's about 3.2 to 5. 0.1 degrees. It's difficult to measure this angle kappa in the everyday life in the clinical uh, practice, but we can estimate the angle kappa, whether it's large or uh, small angle kappa, by the distance or the pupil offset from the corneal vertex. So if the pupil center is way uh, away from the corneal vertex, this denotes that large angle kappa. If they are closer together, this means that the patient has smaller angle kappa. Uh, uh, angle kappa is associated with the uh, in, uh, increased disintegration of the multifocal lens after implantation in relation to the pupil center and this might impact the visual outcomes of the multifocal lens. Sometimes it's uh, uh, associated with higher incidence of halos and glare while the other lit literature stated that there is no uh, correlation between the large angle kappa and the visual outcomes after implantation of this lens. This is another study showed that the patients with small angle kappa and large angle kappa showed no statistical significant difference regarding the corrected and the uncorrected distance visual acuity. And again, it has no impact on the distance corrected intermediate visual acuity at 80 centimeter and distance corrected near visual acuity at 40 and 25 centimeters. So it's very controversial and most probably it's related to the design of the IOL that used during the uh, research of the, uh, of the, uh, the examination. So generally agreed now, patients with large angle kappa, let's say the 0.7 millimeter cord lens between the corneal vertex and pupil center, most probably the visual axis passed through the edge of the ferrous diaphragmatic ring of the multifocal lens and this will cause nighttime halos and glare or visual dysphotopsias. And patients or eyes with smaller angle kappa or let's say 0.3 cord lens, most probably the visual axis will pass within the first diaphragmatic ring and this will not induce visual dysphotopsias. So it's better to stay on the safe side and not to include patients with large angle kappa and we can estimate this large angle kappa by the cord lens. So my personal insight here is not to include patients with uh, pupil offset more than 0.5 uh, millimeter uh, with the multifocal technology, most probably I can I can think of either offense in this subset of uh, patients, and of course don't include patients with large mesopic pupil larger than uh, five millimeter in uh, diameter. What about now that choosing the right IOL? We have different designs of the trifocal and multifocal lenses and either lenses now available in the market and each IL has its different design. Some IELs are apodized, some IELs are non-apodized, some IELs are pupil dependent, others are not pupil dependent and the distribution of the light energy is different between different designs of the IOL. 
I'm talking about this, uh, the IOLs is out of the scope of this presentation, so I'm not talking about how the IOL are different from each other, but you have to be acquainted with the designs of the IOL and uh, what about the uh, reading distance and intermediate distance uh, each IOL can provide and the light energy distribution in the photopic and mesopic pupil and, uh, before uh, assigning a specific IOL to the patient. Of course, uh, choosing the IOL is very much related to the lifestyle of the patients and of course you should stay uh, a significant amount of chair time before the surgery to have an idea about the patient occupation lifestyle hobbies and of course never assign these uh, multifocal lenses in professional drivers and pilots as i mentioned before and instead of these subjective measurements or uh, of the lifestyle we can objectively measure the lifestyle of these patients by the new device it's called viver i don't have any financial interest uh, this this small device like a stick uh, device that can be mounted on the uh, glass frame and the patient can wear this uh, 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 device for a couple of days or more uh, and this device uh, and the patient will uh, perform his or her routinely daily life and this device can uh, measure the uh, working distance at every time and the illumination that the patient used to read or work uh, during the daytime. And after that, the, we can get a report here, as you can see. For example, this is the patient that most of his daily time is doing some activities in the intermediate distance. So most probably this patient will be happy with the ED of lens more than with the other trifocal lenses. And most of the time that this patient is uh, in the intermediate distance, in mainly in the mesopic condition. So we need to provide lens with better quality of vision in the mesopic in the mesopic condition to provide more light energy toward the distance focus in the mesopic condition. So this helps to in, uh, choose objectively the best IOL designed for the every patient in particular. What about now the accurate biometry? Of course, we will talk about the precise measurement, the formula, optimized the constant and astigmatism. Precise measurement can be guaranteed by optical biometry. Don't please, don't do ultrasound biometry. There is no room for ultrasound biometry in modern cataract refractive surgery. Uh, we can do immersion ultrasound biometry in cases of dense cataract or we can resort to sweat source OCT because it proved to uh, this device can penetrate through a dense cataract and give better uh, results with the dense cataract. Uh, another merit of the sweat source OCT that we can um, validate visually validate the measurement of the excellence, which is very important, of course, uh, to get an accurate biometry. And this device, because of the incorporated OCT and B-scan, we can get an idea about the status of the macula. This one of my patients, this patient asked for multifocal lens, and during the biometry, you can see here, there is some abnormal reflections on the fovea, and I sent the patient to do a macular OCT, and it's confirmed the diagnosis of cerebral maculopathy. So this patient was not scheduled, of course, for the multifocal lens. Again, the swept source OCT now can uh, measure the posterior corneal surface and posterior corneal astigmatism because uh, we know now that the anterior corneal astigmatism and posterior corneal astigmatism are not always correlated to each other. We thought that they are correlated with regards to the axis and regards with the amplitude, but it was proven by Dr. Scott, no, because there is continuous drift of the anterior corneal astigmatism from with the rule toward against the rule, while the posterior corneal astigmatism stays essentially against the rule of the steep axis of the posterior corneal surface essentially uh, stays in the vertical meridian. And so it's very important nowadays not to predict or guess the posterior corneal astigmatism and the posterior corneal surface, you know, rather than we can measure now with the modern biometric machines the posterior corneal astigmatism, and this helps for the decision making for the multifocal lens. This is an example of one of my patients. You can see that the anterior corneal surface measured 0.8 diopter of corneal astigmatism, which is needs something to do for this corneal astigmatism to be more compatible with the multifocal technology. But when we measure the posterior corneal astigmatism and calculate 
and this machine calculates the total corneal astigmatism, surprisingly that the total corneal astigmatism is less than 0.5 diopters, which is compatible, of course, with the multifocal lens. I don't, do, I don't have to do anything for this low amount of astigmatism. If the astigmatism is above 0.5, Probably I have to do something to uh, address this astigmatism, as I will show you in the after few slides. So the measurement nowadays of the posterior corneal astigmatism is essential part for accurate biometry, especially in the era of the multifocal IOL technology. Uh, what about the formula? Of course, we should now shift to the fourth generation biometry formula. And my personal preference here is the Barrett Universal 2. Of course, we can do the Holiday 2 formula or Olsen formula or uh, Hague's uh, or, uh, excuse me, um, uh, Hill formula. But I prefer the Barrett Universal 2 formula in this because it proved to be more accurate compared to other uh, formulas. Uh, of course, we should do uh, uh, optimization of the econocents because it's different from surgeon to another, from different from lens to another. So accurate biometry is now essential part for the multifocal lenses and this, this can be achieved again with the accurate measurement, accurate, uh, accurate formula and optimization of the econocents. We had the uh, user group for laser interference biometry, which is known as ULIP. It was launched by Dr. Hages uh, in 19. 99, but this unfortunately, this uh, uh, website has no update since 2016 and was focused essentially on Zeiss Biometer. Nowadays, we have a new updated um, uh, website, it's called IOLCON. Dot org. It's free to download. It has a modern biometry base because it's launched at 2017. It's independent of specific devices, not like the uh, ULIP, which was mainly focused on Zeiss devices. Now this can work with any devices, any IOL manufacturers or any surgeon and can provide optimized a constant at glance. So I do recommend to optimize the a constant through this website. It's free to download. And what about now the astigmatism? Astigmatism does not match with the multifocal technology. They don't love each other. They don't like each other. Uh, with the astigmatism of 0.5 daughters or less, there is no significance on, uh, of the astigmatism on the visual outcomes with the multifocal lenses. But if astigmatism is 1.5 daughters, there is significant reduction of the corrected distance visual acuity with the multifocal lens as well as with the, uh, on the corrected distance near visual acuity, uh, even to be more uh, to be worse compared to the monofocal lens. So with the uh, stigmatism of 1 to 1.5 diopters, the visual outcomes with the multifocal lens would be much uh, uh, worse compared to the monofocal lens, the visual quality and the visual outcomes. So astigmatism be, uh, beyond 1 diopter should be addressed. And my personal insight here is to address astigmatism beyond 0 0.7 or beyond 0 0.75 diopters on the corneal level. Again, astigmatism of one diopter or more is associated with increased perception of nighttime halos and glare. Accurate biometry, of course, we should do the corneal topography to address the astigmatism and to have an idea about the quality of the astigmatism. We should include only regular astigmatism with regular symmetric bow tie. Don't include patients with asymmetric bow tie in the uh, multifocal uh, group of implantation because it's difficult to treat this kind of astigmatism and most probably will end with residual error and higher corneal abrasions and the patient would complain about the nighttime halos and clear and suboptimal visual outcomes. My personal uh, um, criteria for treating astigmatism, if the astigmatism is 0 0.5 or less, I don't do anything. Maybe I can do on axis incision for the cornea or the uh, pico emulsification, but if astigmatism is beyond 0 0.5 and less than 1.2, uh, 1 one quarter of the author of astigmatism, I should do something for this astigmatism. I personally prefer to do astigmatic keratotomy with the femtosecond laser technology. And astigmatism beyond 1.25 uh, 
and more, I should do a, a toric multifocal IOLs. Of course, during calculation of astigmatism, don't forget to include the posterior coronal astigmatism. If you have the device that this, like the swift source OCT or the shine fluke image to measure the posterior coronal astigmatism, it would be perfect. But if you don't have the device, you can use the bail or nomogram in the cases of astigmatism, or again, is the rule, you can increase the, the uh, measurement by 0 0.3. And if you have astigmatism with the rule, we can deduct 0 0.5 diopters to get the idea or the estimate of the total coronal astigmatism and do your calculation based on this. Uh, what about the surgical technique? We will focus on capsular axis and OVD and astigmatism management here. This is the capsular axis of of course, you should keep the capsorexes, um, you construct the capsorexes to be 5, 5.5 millimeter centered on the visual axis, as you can see in the movie here. And if it's better to use the calibrated uh, rexes forceps. This my rexes forceps was not calibrated at the time of surgery, so I did just marking by scratching on the shaft of the uh, rexes forceps 2.5 millimeter from the from the tip and now I had a calibrated forceps that helps me a lot to do uh, optimized, uh, customized Rex is 5 or 5.5 millimeter uh, and it was uh, in, 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 and it is reproducible every time I'm doing the Rexes. Of course the femtosecond laser technology has its room here. We can resort on femtosecond laser technology because not only we can get a precise Rex's size 5.5, 5.2, but the location of the rexes is very important here. The capsulotomy you can see with the femtosecond laser now with the catalyst, they can uh, do the capsulotomy centered on the uh, on the ge geometric center of the lens capsule, which is pretty close to the visual axis. So we can get better results because this uh, the technology can scan with the incorporated OCT, can scan the lens capsule and detect the geometric center and place the capsulotomy on the geometric center of the lens capsule. So it has a room for the uh, rule or for the multifocal IOL to get a better results. Regards the surgical technique, it's uh, pretty normal as a surgical technique, but you should use the cohesive OVD. I personally like to use the cohesive OVD because the cohesive OVD is easier to uh, wash out the anterior chamber compared to the dispersive OVD. Presence of OVD inside the eye or behind the lens might use lens disintegration and this will definitely compromise the visual outcome in the year in the early post-operative period again and don't leave the uh, lens until make sure that the lens is centered in within the lens capsule and the capsulotomy covers 360 degrees uh, of the lens optic and the Purkinje reflex is within the first diffractive ring of the multifocal IOL. Uh, I, you can do again some posterior corneal polishing uh, just uh, to make sure that the, to prevent capsular thymosis and sometimes unequal or uneven capsular thymosis might cause lens disintegration and tilt in the late post-operative period. So to guarantee uh, good visual outcomes uh, down the road for 10 or 20 years after the implantation, try to be more meticulous and do some polishing of the posterior as well as the anterior uh, uh, lens capsule in order to minimize the capsular thymosis and of course to minimize the uh, incidence of posterior capsule opacification because these lenses are very sensitive to the posterior capsule op opacification or minor corrugation of the lens capsule after the surgery. Uh, here uh, you can see that um, uh, we can use take benefits of the digital markers. Uh, this digital marker can detect the steep axis and you can see here that uh, uh, the lens is pretty well centered and uh, this is the visual axis and you can see that the uh, uh, visual axis is within the uh, first diffractive ring of this lens. So I'm sure that this patient will enjoy good quality of vision. So we can take advantage as you have access to the, one of those devices, the digital markers to, uh, it helps on construction of the rexes and to, to, de to detect the steep axis of astigmatism and try to correct it. And of course, for centration of the eye before conclusion of the surgery. You can see this is another example that this patient has astigmatic keratotomy to correct against the rule astigmatism. And you can 
see that the astigmatism at uh, 100 or maybe at five degrees, and it was pretty well centered on the steep axis thanks to the digital marker and in conjunction with the femtosecond laser technology. Uh, this is an example for patients. Uh, they, um, scheduled for multifocal lens, the patient had astigmatism on the cornea level 0.7 diopter and after astigmatic keratotomy with the femtosecond laser, we could reduce the astigmatism to 0.27 diopters and you can see this is the astigmatic keratotomy on slit lamps. So we can take benefits of the technology, we can um, hitting more and more closer to the emetrochia by addressing astigmatism with the femtosecond laser technology or by incorporating the toric multifocal IOLs. So before conclusion here, this is my list, the most important do's and don'ts. Do optical biometry. Of course, you should do and include the posterior corneal surface. Optimize your A constants and use the first generation uh, biometry formula like Barrett Universal 2. You should get an idea about the tear film analysis. If you don't have those devices, you can do corneal topography as a screening method to have an idea about the uh, anterior corneal surface. And of course, you should measure the astigmatism and get idea about the quality of the astigmatism on the anterior corneal surface by the corneal topography. Spend some time, uh, chair time in front of the patient trying to discuss the uh, compromises of the multifocal technology and get an idea about the, uh, the patient lifestyles and hobbies and uh, it's better, of course, to get an uh, objective uh, measurement by the devices, the newer devices now available in the market. Definitely, you have to tackle every corneal astigmatism beyond 0 0.5 diopters, and you should do a meticulous surgical technique. Don't convince the patient with this technology. If the patient is happy with the glasses, as I mentioned before, don't try to convince that this is better for the patient lifestyle or whatever. And don't do this kind of surgery for presbyopia without a reflective error or without cataract. And don't do this IOLs for some occupations as professional pilots. And don't do this kind of surgery with corneal astigmatism, which is a symmetric bowtie proved by the corneal topography. And you have don't take any measurements before treating dry eye if present and don't include patients with large mesopic pupil more than zero more than five millimeter in diameter don't include large angle kappa estimated by cord lens beyond 0 0.5 millimeter from the uh, corneal vertex and don't include any patient with sudden maculopathy now last last question should i do multifocal lenses post laser vision correction or not because I've, all the time I've been asked by this question from their colleagues and folks out there uh, would you do laser would you do multifocal IOL after laser vision correction I would do and and don't so do I would do this kind of surgery after laser vision correction if there is good ablation profile. Now we have improved laser machine. We have good ablation profiles, very good centration, large optic zones. So we can do, in these cases, we can do multifocal technology. And of course, we have now improved biometry formulas and improved devices that can measure the posterior corneal astigmatism and get an idea about the accurate key readings and the total corneal astigmatism. So, and of course, we have enhanced now technology regards the IOLs. We have the EDOF lens. So we, if we are hesitant, we probably go for the EDOF lens in this patient to provide some sort of improved depth of focus and functional intermediate vision. I don't do multifocal lenses post laser vision correction if the corneal care readings is outside the range of between 36 to 47 diopters. If there is excessive dry eye of the, or if there is decentered ablation or higher order abrasion, uh, you can see in this example the um, Fourier analysis. You can see this wacky, distorted coma. So definitely, I won't implant this kind of lenses in this cornea, and you should don't implant these lenses if the patient is not willing to do laser touch-up after implantation because you should keep a rule for yourself that might have some residual refractive error after implantation even after the improved device and improved biometric formula you might get some residual refractive error so the patient might must understand that he might go again for the laser machine to do the laser touch-up a few weeks after the IOL implantation uh, 
And now I think I finished my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Ahmed, for this informative information, comprehensive, uh, that's for sure. Um, we have a couple of questions. Uh, so I will start with the chat questions. So uh, what about high order abrasions? Shall we consider trifocal for it or not? Excuse me again, can you repeat the question? Uh, what about high order abrasions? High order abrasions, of course, high order abrasions should be considered uh, um, during uh, um, multifocal IOL implantation, and usually within the normal range, uh, spherical abrasion 0 0.27, coma and trefoil should not exceed 0 0.33 micrometers, and the total RMS should not exceed 0 0.3. Of course, uh, this should be considered, but usually if you have a regular cornea, if you have cornea without uh, tear film abnormalities, most probably you will get the higher order abrasions within the normal range. Okay. Um, another question. Would you? What would you recommend in absence of tear tear film analyzer? Uh, I mentioned uh, this. Uh, we can do just corneal topography, but most of the time when we do corneal topography, you just pay attention on the corneal astigmatism and the quality of the astigmatism. We didn't look at. We don't look at the corneal myers. So please have a look on the corneal myers because this will give you uh, a huge amount of data regards the tear film of this eye. So look for the corneal myers and look for distortion of the corneal myers if you have any subtle distortion. This patient or this eye suffers of dry eye and should be addressed. Okay. Okay, another question. If you have angle kappa that is 0 0.5, would you go for multifocal IOL or trifocal? Um, very good question. This on the margin. So uh, uh, probably I can do a multifocal lens, provided I'm trying to make a good centration intraoperatively or uh, will take uh, benefit of the femtosecond laser. But to be on the safe side, in this occasion, I would go for the EDOP lens, extended depth of focus, because this lens provides excellent quality of vision for distance and a functional vision of near with less instance of visual dysphotopsis, especially in the, in the cases of high angle kappa. I would like to emphasize that uh, the angle kappa in relation to visual dysphotopsis is related to the type of the IOL, because some multifocal lenses have very small diaphractive ring, the inner diaphractive ring is very small, so the, with the large angle kappa, there is high incidence that the visual axis will hit the edge of the, this diaphractive uh, ring and definitely the patient will complain of this photopsis. So you should know uh, or should learn about the multifocal lens that you are planning to implant in this eye with angle kappa if the the innermost diaphractive ring is uh, for example less than one or one millimeter I would not implant the multifocal lens in high angle kappa of 0 0.5. If the angle kappa, like the, for example, the physiol lens, the fine vision physiol lens is 1.15, as I guess, 1.25. So this is beyond the double of 0 0.5. So in this case, I might implant the fine vision with confidence. But to be in the safe side, if you are uh, hesitant about the visual dysphotopsis and you want to be a trouble free uh, with the patients, you can implant the EDO lens with confidence. Okay, I have a, a continuation of the previous question regarding the tear film, uh, the absence of the tear film analyzer. And if I, if I don't have topography at the clinic, which means that I am not the one to do it, what do you do? Ask the technician to print the, uh, the Myers. You can get a report with the Myers, uh, not only the anterior surface or the posterior surface. With the Myers, you can ask the technician for this, or you can do fluorescein breakup time and the, in the surgery, but in, in the office. But I, I do prefer the, uh, the corneal topography and look at the Myers. So you can ask the technician to print out the Myers in the report. And by the way, I would like to emphasize the, the corneal topography, not tomography. Because tomography oh, like the pentacam, yeah, the tomography like the pentacam and the shine fluke image does not 
reflect uh, Myers on the surface of the cornea. So you should get at the corneal topography. There are some machines that can include both technologies, the, the reflection technology of the Placido disk and the shine fluke uh, principle in the same uh, uh, device, but other machines are dedicated only for the tomography or the shine fluke principle and corneal topography. So corneal topography is very important to assess the tear film quality in these patients. Okay. I hope uh, Dr. Asaf answered the question of Dr. Amjad Shahata. Uh, another question from our dear friend, Dr. Osama al Hassani from Iraq. He says, hi, Hajj. What is your experience with the toric multifocal IOL? Uh, perfect. Uh, toric multifocal IOLs is quite uh, similar to the toric monofocal lens. You should uh, measure the astigmatism and include posterior coronary astigmatism. I stopped using uh, ink marking. I now use the digital marking to, uh, to um, uh, calculate or to um, detect the steep, uh, steep corneal axis and of course to compensate for the cyclotorsion. Uh, there is nothing wrong with the toric multifocal lens. The quality of vision is perfect. Okay. Especially physiol, of course. Um, <laughs> a question from Abir Khattab. If a 30 years old patient with mild uh, DR still don't do for EDOF? I, I, don't, I don't understand the question well, but I think mild, I'm asking... Mild, mild DR? Yes. Diabetic retinopathy, maybe? Ah. Maybe yes. Maybe yes. Maybe diabetic retinopathy. Uh, Thirty years age with diabetic retinopathy is is to, to it's it's not it's not it's a bad sign. This means that the patient has some sort of uncontrolled diabetes, or the his diabetes or her diabetes is very aggressive, and I don't prefer to do prescribe correcting IOL. Maybe maybe I think of the uh, ED of plans in this case, but um, with cautious. But if because. I can understand that the patient is 30 years old and it's quite difficult that this patient with 30 years old to ask her to have uh, reading glasses. At least uh, we should provide some intermediate visual uh, uh, acuity without glasses for this patient to just deal with the screens or the mobile phones. So if mild diabetic retinopathy, I would do OCT to make sure that there is no diabetic macular edema. And if proved that there is no diabetic macular edema, I would do either lens in this patient in particular, and I will ask the patient for tight control of her or his diabetic retinopathy, and keep regular follow up with the uh, vitreoretinal retinal surgeon, and do whatever necessary to uh, treat any potential diabetic maculopathy. Okay. Nice question from our dear friend Yusuf Alwan. How to ensure that the IUL centration remains post-op after centering it well on the first Purkinje reflex during the surgery? Uh, he asked about the centration of the eye, maybe eye tracing. <laughs> 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 okay. It, it's a very good mix. It, it's a very good match with the double C loop, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first of all, centration uh, of the lens. The lens uh, it's centered on the anatomical basis of the capsule. So if you try to, to just move the lens in the, in the nasal axis or the, in the temporal side uh, during the surgery, after one or two weeks, you will find that the lens has been shifted to where it should be uh, based on the lens capsule. So uh, that's why we should include patients with small angle kappa because uh, the smaller the angle kappa, the, the visual axis would be closer to the pupil center and that's why uh, we can guarantee good visual acuity. Regards the question of uh, Dr. Youssef, how we can guarantee, of course, uh, we can uh, uh, we can do some ocular aberometer and uh, we can uh, separate the uh, uh, coma, for example, the total ocular coma from the corneal coma. If there's proof that internal coma is so high, that means that the IOL is decentered. And of course, we can go to some other devices like the eye tracing to, to uh, see the decentration of the lens. Okay. Uh... I have so many questions, Dr. Asaf. No, so it's okay. I, it's okay. I, I, will, I will try to uh, take the nice ones. Okay, I have here um, from Dr. Rabah. Is multifocal IOL contraindicated in patients who have diabetes with no diabetic retinopathy? Uh, 
Uh, it depends on the duration of the diabetes. So if the diabetes, the diabetes is five years, seven years, probably I would do multifocal lens and keep following up this patient. If the diabetic, uh, the, the patient has diabetes of about 15 years, 12 years, so I'm reluctant to implant these lenses in this patient, even in the absence of diabetic retinopathy, because potentially there will be diabetic retinopathy in the near future. Okay, uh, I have a question from uh, Ashraf Al Bayoumi. Uh, I think you answered this question. Can you do clear lens extraction? Yes, I can do clear lens extraction, but not, but not in eyes without the refractive error. We can okay. do refract, we can do a clear lens extraction and press biopsy IOL implantation as long as there is significant refractive error. And as I showed in the slide here, you can see this one. Maybe it's better to highlight. You can see this. This is the the upper bar is the eyes without the significant cataract. Let's say the clear lens. So in this patient, if the patient has a moderate hypropia, this patient will benefit of presbyopia correcting IOLs even with the moderate hypropia. But low myope, I would never do clear lens, lens extraction for low myope. For mid uh, mid uh, uh, for moderate myopia, yes, we can do uh, provided that the, the patient has thorough posterior segment examination to make sure that there is no retina issue, especially in the periphery of the retina and vitre space. The high, the high myopia and the high hypropia, I don't approach this patient uh, even uh, because you know that, uh, as mentioned before, the, the difficult to get accurate biometry in high hypropia and most probably the patient with high myopia and high exit lens uh, would complain of some sort of myopic maculopathy. What about binocular surgery at the same time? <laughs> it's a very tricky question. Sometimes, to be honest, sometimes I do it in special occasions, uh, but uh, it's not my routine. I don't advise because we have strict measure, uh, measurement in our facility. We do a, a cassette and preco tip for each eye. Uh, we do disposable uh, for each eye separately and uh, we separate uh, after doing one eye i just go out and uh, scrub again and uh, we change all the instruments maybe change the machine and get another machine and if we didn't change the FECO machine we'll change the cassette and the FECO tip as well okay. brand new i have an interesting uh, question from sherlock uh, excellent presentation, Dr. Asaf. Uh, it's a two-part question. Any experience with multifocal insertion in case of PCR? And any preference regarding the choice between panoptics, physiol, or at least? <laughs> Maybe I'll answer the first question is much easier. <laughs> 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 okay, the PCR, according to the PCR, PCR means the posterior capsule rupture. So uh, maybe uh, I have a video, I'll show it in, in one of the webinars, and maybe I will just uh, upload it in my uh, YouTube channel. Of course, we can do implantation of the uh, multifocal lens. The issue that with the multifocal lens here, that they are available only in a single piece form. It's, they are not available in the multi-piece form. So, these lenses should be implanted in the bag. There is no way to implant this lens in the sulcus. And provided that the fine vision, also the, uh, the overall diameter is shorter compared to the other lenses. So these lenses should not Im be implanted in the sulcus. So uh, if there is a PCR according to the PCR, if the small PCR, small posterior capsule rupture, and you have enough uh, support from the remnant of the posterior capsule, of course, why not? You can do implantation of the lens inside the bag. If the uh, PCR is large, I would do implant the lens inside the bag and do reverse optic capture. Reverse optic capture means that they will pop out the optic of the lens above the rexus. So the, uh, uh, the optic will be uh, above the rexus in the sulcus while the haptics will be inside the capsular bag within the fornices. This way, the haptics are in the, in the uh, capsular bag and the lens won't fall in the posterior segment because it has been captured by the uh, uh, rexus. Of course, it's very important that you would have a central rexus 
and the rexes should be less than the optic of the eye really at least should be about 5.5.5 millimeter if you have large rexes you cannot do this uh, reverse optic capture because you cannot do the optic capture if the rexis is beyond the uh, or larger than the optic of the lens and as you know that the optic of the lens is about six millimeters so if you have rexis six millimeters or more definitely you cannot do the reverse optic capture so to wrap up it's according to the situation so sometimes we can implant the lens comfortably inside the lens capsule and the line inside the uh, uh, capsular bag with uh, with no issues if you have a small posterior capsule rupture especially in the upper quadrant if you have a good remnant in the posterior capsule in the inferior quadrant definitely you can implant the lens with the, with ease of course you should manage the vitreous if any vitreous prolapse in the anterior segment if you have large capsular tear you can implant still implant the lens but you have to do the reverse optic capture and one of the uh, um, the uh, main prerequisite for the uh, reverse optic capture is to do is to have a very central uh, customized rexes between 5 to 5.5 millimeter in diameter uh, do you want to answer the second part of the question? Ah, the second part, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I don't have any financial interest, to be honest. So, uh, Acrylisa, I don't have experience, to be honest, with Acrylisa, but I heard in the literature it, it, it's, it's, it's doing good. Uh, maybe there are some issues with the nighttime halos and glare compared to the other uh, lenses like the Panoptics and the Physiol and the Fine Vision, but my first choice to be honest with the fine vision, usually the fine vision, my first choice, because I don't have any issues since I start using these lenses four or five years ago. And uh, even the chair time with the patients preoperative and after the implantation is much less compared to the other lenses. Now, I don't take too much time trying to, to explain the patient about the nighttime halos and glare because it's very temporary. And sometimes the patient don't even uh, uh, notice this. Uh, compared to the other uh, multifocal lenses. So my first choice is fine vision. Panoptics is a great lens. I cannot say uh, anything about it, uh, but I prefer the fine vision as the first choice. Excellent, excellent. Uh, a nice question. I will try to wrap up it uh, shortly. So uh, from our friend Sebastian, a wonderful presentation. What is your multifocal experience with keratoconus cornea? Multifocal with keratoconus, I won't implant multifocal in keratoconus. Never, never. Me too. Uh, for yeah, for for several issues. First of all, you cannot get like accurate biometric because this is a multifocal cornea. The multifocal the keratoconus is a multifocal cornea, and this cornea is subjected with to very high uh, 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 corneal abrasions, and the spherical abrasions now is turned toward the negative side. Uh, and the coma, of course, we definitely have coma and trifoil beyond the normal range and uh, quite difficult even if there is some astigmatism, where is the astigmatism, where will you calculate on the topographic astigmatism or the comatic astigmatism or the corneal coma. So it's quite difficult to get accurate biometry and I don't think that the patient would be happy if the multifocal lens has been implanted. Maybe in some cases of foam thrust keratoconus or some suspicious cornea I did, where a couple of those patients uh, that have some asymmetric bow tie, it's not a frank keratoconus, I would implant uh, the uh, triumph lens. I have implanted a couple of, uh, of uh, lenses in, the, in, um, in a patient with suspicious cornea and the patient is doing very fine. Okay. Uh, I will take two more questions. Uh, what is your rate of touch up if you are out of refraction with fine vision? Uh, let's say about uh, maybe five percent. It's it's a, it's a, it's a function of biometry and precision measurement before the surgery. So maybe it's five percent. I did one or maybe five patients, three patients, less than five percent even. Okay, it's not too much. Uh, uh, just a moment. Yes, uh, just a moment. Yeah, uh, because uh, first of all. Uh, try before the surgery because i keep telling my patients that i don't guarantee 100 percent of spectacle independence so i used to say to my patients that after implanting this premium lens 
occasionally in very specific times like sewing for example or like driving between cities uh, for a long time uh, uh, for five or six or seven hours you might need some uh, correction of residual astigmatism or residual effective error so that's why maybe this can translate why I don't have too much laser touch up after the surgery. If the patient is complaining of quality of vision because of this minor residual astigmatism, if any, or a spherical error, if any, I would do laser touch up and that's why my rate is very low. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ala Zawawi, I, I personally miss you and I hope to see you soon. He's asking what is the role of CTR in multifocals and toric multifocals, uh, especially in high myopes? It's controversial. Uh, some in some literature, you find that they provide the good stability of the lens uh, inside the capsular bag, and the others say that uh, there is, it has no rule. And I believe that the capsular tensioning has no rule for stabilization of the lens inside the capsular bag. I don't do uh, as a routine to implant the CTR with the toric or the multifocal lens. Okay, uh, I will take a last question from uh, Afif Ullah. What changes we will do in biometry for multifocal IOL? Uh, I don't get the question, but there is no, mm -hmm. no, no, specific, no specific change. Maybe, maybe we would ask about the formula. If you, are, if you do the holiday one, for example, or other SRKT, uh, the third generation biometric formula, of course, you should shift yourself to the fourth generation formula. And I do recommend the Barrett Universal 2. And regard the measurement, of course, there is no room, as I mentioned before, for the contact ultrasound biometry. You should do optical biometry. And that's it. Of course, you can get an idea about the corneal astigmatism, not only by the biometry, but by with the corneal topography or tomography. Can I take uh, a last one from Hams? Please, yeah, um, Hams. <laughs> yeah, I know you are busy and you have appointments, so last one. Thank you for the informative presentation. Any feedbacks from patients implanted multifocal lenses if they need retinal laser photo photocoagulation? Is it absolutely contraindicated to put ED of post RK? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> Very tricky question. There are two questions, by the way. Not yes. One. yes. Uh, the first, the first question uh, regards the uh, impact of the multifocal optics on the uh, subsequent procedure for the posterior segments regards the laser photocoagulation or the vitrectomy. Personally, I didn't hear from uh, our retina colleagues that there is something wrong with this uh, lenses implanted. I have a couple of patients already did vitrectomy before and did laser and there is no complaint. They did very well laser and vitrectomy because of the retina detachment. So I don't think it, uh, it has an impact. Maybe it may be tricky somehow to focus the laser energy on the retina, but I, I've never uh, referred back one of patients to explant this lens before the, doing the PRP or the argon laser, for example. Regards the second questions, of course, we can do uh, uh, either lens in RK patients, but to, in some selected patients. Uh, the number of RK is very important. Uh, not Don't implant this lens, the aid of lens, in if the RK is more than uh, 8 or, or 12, maybe 4. I, I would implant these lenses, of course, be cautious. And of course, we should get an idea about the, uh, the anterior surface of the cornea and corneal irregularities. And of course, the tear fell. And I will focus, of course, expected that this cornea is not normal cornea, it has a lot of irregularities, but if the central optic zone is clear uh, and I can count on this, the central optic zone, I would implant uh, aid of lens in uh, previous RK patients, provided that sometimes the RK are short, not long the encroaching on the uh, pupillary zone or the, the visual axis. Sometimes you find that the RK is very close to the visual axis of the patient, maybe uh, two or three millimeters to correct a high degree of myopia in the past. So this patient won't be happy after implanting the edof lens, but we can implant the edof lens if the number of the RK is four or maybe, maybe eight, but not more. And the provided that the RK is short and not encroaching on the center of the pupil. 
Well, thank you very much, Professor Asaf. Uh, there are uh, so many other questions. Uh, we will try to share it to you, and we will answer each and every single one uh, by writing. Uh, amazing, as usual. Thank you very much. Uh, hope to see you very soon, uh, Professor Asaf, and hope very soon we will try with you the isofocal technology and to get your feedback uh, on, on that EDOF lens. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. I enjoyed this webinar very much and uh, enjoyed the questions and would like to thank the old BBI team and Visual team for this uh, collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. You too. Bye.